to Creative Arts Apothecary. I'm your host, Marina Zellner, and I'm so happy to introduce my guest, Susan Perrow. Susan's genre is story medicine. She writes therapeutic stories for all kinds of challenging situations for all ages, from individual to community to global. For 20 years, she has traveled internationally giving keynotes and therapeutic story writing seminars for teachers, therapists, and parents worldwide. And now she teaches online. Susan has four resource books of therapeutic stories in 13 languages. Feel free to check them out at her website, susanperro.com, P-E-R-R-O-W. And we will link this video to her website. So check out her work. Susan, welcome. Thank you. What an honor to be invited to do this. So I would like by read I would like to start reading a couple of sentences out of my latest book. It's a just a cultural honoring to the indigenous background in storytelling for thousands of years that I think all our story work today stands on. And so before books, before writing, for thousands of years, many thousands of years, storytelling was integral to our humanity. The storyteller was the carrier of folklore and morals, the teacher and the healer. His or her words were soothing and strengthening and motivating balm for children and adults alike. In many Indigenous cultures, story embraced and still embraces everything, all life, connectedness, nature and community. The stories and the storyteller stitch life and purpose and earth and sky together. In times of grief and loss, strength would be drawn from the stars, solace gained from sitting by a river, pain eased by walking through a forest. Stories were created that wove nature threads into healing journeys and to this day continue to weave their healing work. The world has so much to learn from this wisdom and we have so much to learn from this wisdom. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Can you tell us a little bit more about those words, please? Well, I I put those words together. I then visited a friend of mine, an Indigenous local elder, Auntie Delta K, just to see if that felt good for her. And her response was that they the words flowed through her like a sweet river. So I thought, ah, I have her approval. I'll put them in my book, as I always like to refer to that, because it's easy to forget that that, that was such story-centered learning and knowing was such an important part of the past and we need to find ways to, to come back to that. I think we do. Can you tell us a little bit more about your own personal journey into um, therapeutic story writing? How did you discover it? Well, I like to share this because for the first 30 to 35 years of my life, I had very little interest in stories. I'd, at um, school, I was an um, honours math student. Uh, creative writing was my worst, my m most least favourite subject. But in my mid-30s, I was a mother of three young boys and a common sense just spoke to me that I should put them to bed by reading them stories, certainly not put them to bed by letting them fall in asleep in front of the screen so I would borrow books from the library and read my boys stories and on one particular night a story that talked about this little helping elf that did jobs around the house um, and it was just an, yet another story I'd be reading and the next morning in the dark my seven-year-old was up scrubbing cleaning the bath and for many mornings after that, he was doing secret jobs around the house. And I was just, not only because I was in the throes of becoming a single mother at this point, and so it brought such a joy into my life, but 
as a mathematician and scientist, I was fascinated. How could a story speak so deeply to a child? And then I began creating little stories for my youngest son. He, he laughs about it because he was definitely my most challenging at that point. Um, and sometimes those stories would make a difference. I write a lot about this in my first book. And then as a teacher, I began, I should don't really want to use the word experiment, but I just began um, trying out little stories to do with behaviours in the class with the children, I help them tidy up the classroom or if one child's hurting another. Um, and then things progressed and I ended up doing my master's in storytelling. I set up a course at the local university in this subject. I got a job with the, um, I left teaching to work as a consultant to help with children with challenging behaviour. And I brought this story, I guess, story medicine. I do like that term. I can't ever use it with my books because a good friend of mine has that as his book title, but it's still mm -hmm. relevant to all the work that we are doing. And so it's just, it's grown from there. And one of my favourite uh, I've worked and spent a lot of time in Africa and I really want to acknowledge all of the kind of story, storying I absorbed from the cultures and from the mostly women I was working with. And in the Bushman culture, they have a saying, a story is like the wind. It comes from a far off place and you feel it in your heart. And that's... You see, it's an intangible thing to describe, really. Same with the work that therapeutic stories do. Um, there's no scientific proof, but there's certainly lots of qualitative proof. And that's why I document every time I make a story for someone or I'm involved in the process. Because I run a lot of trainings now, so now I'm a bit like a midwife and helping others write stories birth stories, you could say. Um, but the documentation of did that story make a difference? And if so, did it help a little bit? Did it perhaps just give it a, a tiny whisper of hope or help? Did it do miraculous work and really make a big change and document all of that? And that's what is in all of my books. So it's not just the story, it's the it's the after story, you could say. Of how did the story make a difference? And in the course of this interview, I hope to give a couple of examples. Otherwise, we're just talking theory. Totally. Yeah, I get that. I get that. So let's talk about examples. Talk about an example. And I, I have questions about like the sort of ethical responsibility that I, I see how someone might say this kind of story writing story healing is is a little um manipulative so can can you speak to that from an ethical perspective please well um it's definitely not manipulative work i've done quite a lot of training work in china and i was quite shocked when someone in the audience put their hand up and they said how can i um make up a story that will um um, make my child practice piano and then I find out the child's only three years old anyway and I was quite shocked and I thought oh my goodness that is not what this work is about um, it really the, the ethics and values sit at the core of this and also the um, ch child developmental needs and and so on um, I think the the absolute key and the beauty and the wisdom of a therapeutic story is the metaphors that you work with. And so the metaphors aren't speaking in a direct way. That's the beauty of a metaphor. It's um mm. well, it's a bit like a bridge between two worlds, I think. Look, it's probably best that I I go into a couple of examples. <laughs> All right. <laughs> because, 
a, a therapeutic story can be as simple as something like um, a story that might help children put their shoes together at the door instead of just throwing them in a, any which way um, and just simply because it might be a story about a pair of shoes that like to be friends together and the story might chase the journey and um, trace the journey of those shoes through the day and every time the child jumps the friends jump and when the child sits the friends sit and so on and just that picture that metaphor of the friends together the shoes it has an, a surprising influence over little children which is far better than than giving them lectures and saying you need to develop would have it you need to be more tidy grandma might trip over the shoes it's not safe you know all this information that parents can give to children so a story can be as simple as that but then I have um and I have permission from this particular family to share this example and this comes from a, a training I ran in Zagreb and a mother, together with the, the teenager's therapist, they came to the training and they were desperate for a story to help a 17-year-old teenager. She had developed MS and she could no longer walk. It was a disease she'd inherited from her grandmother. And the parents had bought a wheelchair and the teenager was absolutely not going to be seen in a wheelchair and just wanted to be in her room very difficult situation, especially for the teenager, but also for the family. Now, the, the, the mother and the therapist wrote this little, it was only half a page story, and it was about a black stone and a necklace that a girl had inherited from the grandmother and she wore it with pride. But as the years went on, the necklace grew heavy and she found if she was ice skating, she would sometimes fall. And when she was trying to climb stairs, the necklace was heavy and she couldn't get up many stairs. And, and so the story sort of traces this progression until one day the necklace becomes so heavy that the girl falls to the ground and she can't get up. But when she falls, the black stone cracks open and a beautiful light inside shines a way forward. That's all it is. It's an open ending on this particular story. Many therapeutic stories might need to have a closed ending or a resolution, but here there is this open ending. And a typed copy of this was given to the teenager together with a little talisman, a little amethyst ring that matched the... Um, purple stone inside the black stone that broke open mm. and the next morning the teenager called from her room to the, her parents and she said with the help of the necklace and the story I can use the wheelchair now six years later I visited Zagreb and I was tapped on the shoulder I was giving a talk in a hall and I was called outside and it was embarrassing for the hall because they didn't have a ramp wheelchair ramp up at the bottom of the stairs was this not a teenager anymore 23 year old woman sitting there in her wheelchair with a bunch of flowers and a box of chocolates and she'd heard that I was back in her country she wanted to say thank you and also she wanted to so proudly tell me that she was now at university she was a disability advocate for the university. She had made ramps into all the rooms and an elevator for the lecture theater. And this is a story that has done this wonderful work. So much so that she's been, you know, wanting to come and I didn't even write the story, but I certainly helped with the process. So that's, wow. I know. And I have many examples like that. And there is a, you know, I mean, we can probably be looking at what drives my work. Mm -hmm. And certainly when I get feedback after a story has made a difference, and I wouldn't, uh, uh, this is another one, and I think because it's so topical because of the, um, I'm just going to share my screen. 
Um, this, again, was not a story I wrote, but I um, ran a training for a group of psychologists in India when um, COVID had started. And as part of a training, um, I usually get people to work on a storyboard. And this particular psychologist was having a lot of people coming to see her, mostly adults. And the, the really big problem that had emerged was because everyone was living in cramped spaces, there was this hate speech going on in between, you know, grandparents and children and and adults and and everyone's trying to work at home and do school at home and and the hate speech was becoming such a huge problem and she wrote a story for it and I'll just take you through this storyboard where she starts with the metaphor of the beehive and the beehive wasn't producing any honey so here's this first picture can you see where I'm rolling my cursor around yes yes Yes, and the beehive's not producing any honey because all the bees are so busy stinging each other that they're not going out and finding pollen or not even able to um, to even just operate the beehive. Um, and so she brings in this beekeeper, this helping metaphor. The beekeeper has a magic glove and a magic hammer and also has the ability to make himself very small and he comes inside the beehive and he hammers and shapes and he remakes these little spaces for the bees to be in when they're feeling hateful. And after that, you can see the honey starts flowing and the bees are happy. Now, you could say that's quite idealistic because life doesn't just work out that easily. But she then put words to that story, shared it amongst quite a big group of psychologists in India, and they found that a very helpful. It's the metaphors in the story that can really help speak to people. So even if the families are living in spaces that um, everyone doesn't have their own room to go to, even if they could find a chair to sit in while they're feeling that anger, There's so many examples. It's and it's um it really is so exciting when you know that a story has made a difference. Just one more quickly, because when the pandemic did come, I was he hearing children up and down the road, children of neighbors, even the neighbors themselves, all complaining, oh no, we have to stay home. This is terrible. This is terrible. And the children were talking about the scary germs out there. And I thought, especially for young children, this is not helpful that they are hearing this. How could a story speak to them in a different way? So I wrote this little story and I put it up for free on my social media, on my Instagram page and my Facebook page called The Little Gnome Who Had to Stay Home. And it was all about I'm a little gnome and, you know, he he couldn't quite understand, but Mother Tree would whisper to him, things aren't as they used to be, but trust me, soon you'll be free. And so little gnome stayed in his home amongst the tree roots and he started finding all these wonderful things to do. And then I made up this little song and rhyme of how he could dance and sing and paint and draw and do somersaults across the floor and there were many verses filled with things he could do. So I put that out on for free as a link and it's still on my website because within two weeks, that story was in 26 languages. It had buzzed around the world and I was getting requests from pr pretty much every country. Could we translate it please? And people started making I mean, there's a woman in Mexico who made a shadow puppet play and and other people did different kinds of one one group turned it into an animated film. They're all available for free on my website. And also now the sequels of how back to school for little gnome and how he overcomes the anxiety of going back to school. And so I think the world is thirsting for being talked to in story story language more often 
We can't use stories all the time. There's, of course, there's time mm. for direct, rational language. But um, we need a balance like the Indigenous cultures used to have. And so, yes, so that's that's another very exciting thing that drives me is this global reach of, of, of this story work. Amazing. Uh, amazing. I love it. The ripple effect that it has, that impact for yourself, your family, and those around you. Can you tell us a little bit of what it's like to actually create a story like this? Well, every therapeutic story is different. And I, I let people know in the trainings, there's no recipe. Uh, it's not a cooking class. I certainly can give a framework. We look at what is out of balance and how far, by finding metaphor and finding a story journey, how do we take the situation from out of balance back to balance? Um, sometimes you have to, um, you might hear something intuitively and you should run with that. At other times you may have to quite laboriously plod through the pro the process, make mind maps, gather ideas for metaphors. Mm. And this can apply, uh, and I'll just share the screen one more time, if I may. Please, yes. So mm -hmm. this can apply to do with stories for, I'll just hold this up, stories for behaviours. I mean, I've put out this, this book where there's 42 different stories for different challenging behaviours, and you look what's out of balance Perhaps it's greed and you want it to be a more sharing situation or perhaps it's um, bullying and you want to have more respect for the others. You, you really have to be able to identify what's out of balance, what is the more balance. Um, might be um, me a messy, perhaps someone's really messy and you want them to be more tidy. You know, there's so many practical behavioural issues. But also, I have, um, well, it's bit, you could say it's big and bold, but I think our whole world is out of balance and how can we reach out and make stories for the whole world? And in my, in my last book, The Stories to Light the Night, I've got mm. eight different environmental stories that they're really looking at some kind of proactive resolution I know it's idealistic, but, and I'll just share this, this um, screen. I wrote this particular story called Garden of Light. I wrote it more than 20 years ago, and I shared it on World Environment Day to probably a group of 100 parents and children at a school festival. And I thought that would be the life of that story. Well, this story has reached so far that a university in the Philippines took it up. They made waist high puppets. They presented it at a beginning of an environmental conference just to sort of set the, set the tone. But the big global reach of this is that in Europe, funded by the EU, it's been made into a little booklet and it's been fully illustrated and it's also used on billboards at the start of um, conservation parks because instead of giving information to people, they realise we need to reach people's hearts. And that's what stories do. Yes, it was mm -hmm. simply I just looked what is out of balance in with the environment and I identified, well, it's there's so much greed and power how can we go have a story that goes from greed and lack of care to sharing and care? And this character down in the corner here, that's King Didn't Care. And then I've got a nature weaver. I'm not going, it's a four, four page long story. I can't tell you the whole story now, but through the process of the story, King Didn't Care, who wants to just cut down all the gardens and, and mine for minerals and so on. In the mm. process of the story, the nature weaver together with the children helped transform King Didn't Care into King Care. 
So there we have something out of balance coming back to balance. And yes, it is idealistic, but changing the narrative has to help somehow. And sometimes a story may just sow a tiny seed and you may not even know. Because mm. um, when my three boys were at school, I would sometimes visit the school and go into their classes and tell stories. That was my, I also tried to do canteen duty and those other kind of things that parents do, but um, that was my real gift. And about 10 years later, I'm at the supermarket and the young man operating the checkout, he's putting my groceries through and he looked at me and he said, I remember you. You used mm. to come and tell stories about the knocking door tree forest. And I'd, re I'd made a whole lot of stories about the local forest. And he said, I still go to visit that forest. And when mm. I, I might have a new friend and that will be, that's where I want to take them. That is such a special place for me. And, and when I think back to that particular class that that boy would have been in, I probably only ever told one of those stories once, just once. And yet what a seed that so did him to make him love the forest so much. And David Suzuki, that wonderful environmentalist, he talks of how if we can connect our children to the local environment through stories, mm. they are going to have a heart connection that will hopefully mean when they're an adult, they won't want to be working in a factory that's putting pollution out into the river or the forest. So they they can play such an important role, even though it might be a slow and steady role of change. Can you share it, some tips? How do you get into creative flow? Because people, I often hear, oh, we have ideas for stories, we want to write something, but then it's like, it, you know, life gets in the way. It's hard to get into the creative flow. What do you say to that? I have, I have writer's block. Um, mm. I went, um, my husband would, would tell you, I sometimes say, oh, I can't, I'll never write another story. It's just yeah. oh, I've used up all my creative uses. <laughs> Going camping certainly is wonderful. Getting out into nature. Mm. Walking. Walking is probably the best way I can get my creative juices flowing. And I fortunately live close to a, it's called Seven Mile Beach, so I can walk and walk and walk and I talk to myself as I walk. Mm. Um, reading other folk and fairy tales helps give me, gives inspiration. That's another tip. Doing mind maps um, and just putting perhaps perhaps you want to write a story for a particular reason. Perhaps you want to write a story about um, why we should use less plastic. Yes? So you put that in the middle of the mind map and then you gather ideas around. I say this because at the end of the training yesterday, that's exactly exactly what we were working on. And surprisingly, we ended up finding some story journeys out of that. Um, mind map. Um, sometimes just sitting there with a pen and just saying to yourself, I'm not going to take, I'm going to start writing and I'm not going to take the pen off the paper. Even if you rip up what you've written, it can, once I actually wrote about why I couldn't write. Hmm. So I wrote about writer's blog. And yes, but definitely walking and being in nature is my go-to. Mm, yeah, same here. I love going for a walk as a way to get my creative juices flowing. Definitely. And the mind map, great tip. Mm. What role do you say that stories play, especially now during this time of intense fear, anxiety, collective loss? Can you talk about the importance of stories in these times? 
Well, I think I think stories can play several roles, and that's why this latest book, this one, has been put out. I think in many ways it's the most important book I've put out. There's 94 stories in this book. 34 are by others, by psychologists, mm. social workers, nurses, community workers from all over the world. And I think sometimes um, a story can just help normalise fear and anxiety. Um, it can help build some resilience. Um, it can offer whispers of help. I think in times of grief and loss, we, we should never be saying, oh, a story might help heal this or that. We can't heal mm. grief or loss, but we may be able to find ways to just strengthen resilience and just offer something to take hold of when you when when you're so deep in the in the grief and it's an interesting question because at the moment I'm working together with a, an American woman who's um, based in Romania and she's also a story writer and together it's mainly her work putting out a book because she's been up on the border of Ukraine and um, helping with the sounds terrible word processing of the refugee families coming across the border and she's doing work with the children and she's putting out um, a collection of therapeutic stories and also turning them into coloring in books to give to the children to, to color in to take on their way now you could wonder how could a story even make a difference in in that such terrible times for those families and perhaps perhaps they won't but I think you you just feel you want to offer something and you do, you just don't know you don't know the seeds that they might sow yeah song of the nightingales the little booklet's called and it will soon be out for free online beautiful work beautiful i'll look out for it and all the success to you um in in this partnership the project uh on the border there for helping the refugees and just all all the 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 wonderful work that you do susan we have five more minutes is there something else that you'd like to tell the audience uh yes i'd like to let everyone know for a year and a half i've been um i resisted at first about having an app that had all my stories in audio version because i felt no 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 i want parents to you know use their voice to read my stories and i want teachers to use their voice to read my stories but i've been convinced that in our modern busy world it can be very handy to have a story app mm. it's going to be called rainbow tales I'll just bring up a, no, no, I won't bring mm -hmm. up a slide. People can imagine it. It's going to cover six different categories of therapeutic stories. And over the next year, it starts with 101 stories. And, and over the next year, there'll be another 100 added. It'll illustration for each story and um, beautifully narrated story stories from children from ages three through to 10, but also I think from most ages, because you, I don't think you can put a an age group on some stories. I think some stories can just speak deeply to everyone. So yes, mm -hmm. I wanted to share that, but I wanted to. Um, hmm. I know I can't. I didn't have it loaded. I'm sorry. So I'm just going to have to talk talk to this my very deep inspiration comes from a poet called Owen Barfield he was part of the group called, of English writers called the Inklings included C.S. Lewis and Tolkien and the others very interesting time when you think of the creative work they have produced Tolkien with the Lord of the Rings and so on well Owen Barfield talked a lot about imagination and he talked of how we have this world of matter and the world of the spirit and the bridge between the two from his understanding is the imagination 
He calls it a rainbow bridge of imaginative activity. Mm. And I think it's so important for our world today because so often it can just feel like we're living in the world of matter. And I'm not trying to go into any religious or philosophical rave here, but um, um, from, from my experience, there's more than just the world of matter. And it's this wonderful quality of imagination that can reach us to find these other realms and spaces. Yes, absolutely. So powerful, so useful. I love it. And I also love and appreciate very much the way you were embracing technology. I'm thinking back to the time uh, not long ago when I lost my voice for an extended period of time. And I love reading for my kids before bed, but I just couldn't do it. Um, and so that's when we really embraced the the audio apps and the audio books. And so it's great that you're entering into that sphere. I am so excited for you and for all of us who get to listen to more of your stories. So fantastic. May you go from strength to strength, Susan. And you started so beautifully reading something for this presentation. Would you like to um, help us to wrap it up and read something else as well? Oh, I will just share this. As medicine is used to help restore wholeness or balance to out-of-balance physical conditions, story medicine can be an imaginative and effective strategy to help shift out-of-balance behaviour and problematic situations back towards wholeness or balance. Sometimes magic does happen and a story can make a difference. So I just encourage everyone out there to um, explore this wonderful creative realm along with music therapy, art therapy, drama therapy. There's definitely a very big place for story therapy. Yes. So to our audience, please check out Susan's work. This video will be linked to it. Um, Susan, best of luck with everything. Thank you for joining us. And to the audience, remember to stay creative and have a great day. Bye.